Hi, thanks for joining us today. If this ministry has impacted your life, we want to hear about it. You can send us your story at amen at vnchurch.com. Also, we would love if you would partner with us financially. You can go to vnchurch.com and click the Give Online or text your donation amount to 757-230-2110. To honor copyright laws, we have removed some audio and video elements from this message. Now here's this week's message. Never ever has there been a mighty work of God apart from prayer. It's not that prayer ties God up and makes him do what we want like some kind of puppet, but rather righteous prayer, the kind of prayer that begs, that pleads, that recognizes our inability, our weakness, our dependency, and his super ability to do anything. This kind of I need you desperately prayer does much. So for God to stir in my life, for God to break sin's strongholds, for God to change my heart, for God to burn a fire for his holiness before my eyes, I must pray. The new normal means a life of unceasing prayer. Good afternoon. <clears throat> it's good to see you guys. Good to be with you tonight. Um, okay, so we have been in a series. We just started it last week called The New Normal. And last week, Pastor Andy issued a vision and a challenge for the next 21 days for us to enter into some of the disciplines of the faith, which he asked us that we would pray every day. And then he asked us if we would pray corporately. And we're doing that on a Saturday at 930 here at this church, right? And then he also asked us to find something that we could fast. And a fast is just sustaining, you know, moving away from something in order that you might focus more fully on something else, okay? So that's what we've begun. We're entered into that now. We've got one week completed. And if you weren't here with us last week or you're not joining in at this time, I want to encourage you to come. It's not too late. You can listen online to the message that Pastor Andy gave. And you can join us next Saturday, and you can just jump right in. Not a problem, Mo. We'd love to have you. You know, here at the church, the pastors and some of the leaders um, are not only in addition to the praying each day and doing the Saturday, but we've also joined together in a fast where we have decided to not eat after five, right? And so you'll see us all get skinnier <laughs> now. But in doing that, denying ourselves that pleasure, uh, what we're hoping is that our attention can be turned over to the Lord Jesus Christ during that time. We're asking him that he would move more mightily on you guys and that you would be able to be connected in in a deeper, more meaningful way with him. And so, <clears throat> yes, enter in with us. Join us. We'd love to talk to you about it and help you in any way possible, okay? Now, before I jump into the message, I want to just uh, take a moment, ask the Holy Spirit, which is God's presence, to come and to help uh, to open up what it is he wants to say today to each and every one of you. So if you bow your heads, I'm going to do that. Thank you, Lord. Father, I thank you that your spirit is here and it's moving amongst us even now. I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you say that you indwell those that are believers, those that believe in you, Father, and that you are an agent of wooing to those that are far from you. And so, Holy Spirit, I ask that you would fill this room, that you would fill the airways with your truth. And Father, I can speak a thousand words, but one spoken through the Holy Spirit makes all the difference in the world. And so, Lord, I humbly ask that you would do that for us. And Father, I cannot um, move through the message, move through the day without thinking about those, Father, that lost children this past week and the tragedy. And so, Father, as a congregation, as a group that loves you, Lord, we lift up those families. I know those children reside with you, Lord. But I ask, Father, that you would uh, go there and that you would bring your peace and your comfort. And I remember all those that are sick, Father, with the flu and the devastation there. And I ask that your healing presence would go there also. Father, I thank you for the work that you are doing. And again, Lord, all that we are, may we, I heard that, may we take on the mantle of being the light of the world. Let the church be the light of the world, Lord. Let it usher in the ability to bring healing into our families, into our communities, and yes, Father, into our land. We look to you, the one true author of our faith, to come and to be, be with us now. We need you. 
In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right. Well, you know, I've been uh, doing this pastoring thing for a long time, over 30 years. And so the whole subject of prayer is so exciting to me. I love to talk about that. And uh, I found some truisms with prayer that I wanted to bring in to make you aware of. (laughs) So I'm going to start out our conversation today talking about what I have seen and uh, just bringing it to your attention. And one of the things that I've seen often is that I believe that people are wired up to want to pray. Okay, I really feel like God has wired up, has designed people where they want to naturally pray, right? And you see that even in people that are Buddhist or Muslim or, uh, you know, in the, uh, that are Jewish or Christians or even secular people, right? Now, what they pray to and how they go about it and all that is, is completely different. That's not my point. My point is that they have this internal desire to pray, They have this internal desire to reach out to something bigger than themselves because you and I were made in God's image. I believe he's done that. He's encoded us with this desire to want to talk to him or to reach out to something bigger than ourselves. We see that in Ecclesiastes 3.11. It says, God has planted eternity in the human heart. And so within us, each and every one of us in this room and that are listening online, God has put inside of us this desire to know that we are more than just the here and now and what's going on around us. And so we are always seeking to fulfill that, to find out what does that mean. And in that process, God has hot-wired it up so that we would begin to look for him, to want to seek after him. And I believe that's true of why people desire to pray. Now, right on the heels of that, I also realize that people don't feel like they're very good at prayer, right? Right? They look at it and they go, oh, you know, when I ask them about prayer or we're talking, they're like, well, I'm not very good at it, right? Or I don't really understand it. I don't know how it works. It's frustrating. I pray and nothing's happening and, you know, I wish I could pray better. And so we see this frustration that happens and it's a pretty common thing. No matter how many years you've known the Lord or how long you've walked with him, there's always this wanting to pray better or more or something And so we always feel like we're not doing what we need to be doing there. Matter of fact, the greatest Christian leader of all times was the Apostle Paul. And he penned this in Romans 8, 26. He says, we don't even know what we should pray for, nor how we should pray. And so he's echoing the sentiment that we're not really good at it. We don't really know how to do it, but there's this desire that we want to do it. And I even look at You know, the 12 guys that Jesus uh, brought on board with him when he was walking here on earth, he brought these 12 guys, handpicked them, right, to follow him. And they followed him his entire ministry. And they said this, they want to know how to pray. We see it in Luke 11, 1. One day Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he had finished, one of the disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. And so there's this yearning to want to know. And what I think is so remarkable about the disciples is that they were with Jesus through his entire ministry. They watched him. They watched him do these like intense miracles, miraculous things where he healed the blind, where he raised people from the dead. He walked on water, just these astonishing miracles, right? Astonishing miracles. And they listened to the greatest teacher, the greatest preacher that ever was right? They got to have this firsthand front row seat to that. And yet of all the things they didn't ask, you know, help me, teach me how to do miracles, teach me how to be a great communicator. No, instead what they said is, Lord Jesus, teach us how to pray. Why? Why did they go there? Because I believe they were up close. I believe that they had the front row seat and they were able to see that Really, the power that Jesus had to do all these great things, it seedbed and it birthed in prayer. And they knew the bottom line was, I need to know how to connect with God the Father like that. I need that. And so they asked, Lord, teach us to pray. And I know over the next 21 days, you know, the remainder of that, that we are spending time with the Father. And that is my cry. God, I've been with you for many years, but teach me how to pray. Teach me how to get better at this. Teach me more. I want more. And that's the heart I believe that God wants us to have. Now, I've also learned that not only are we wired up to do this and that we're not very good at it, 
Do you know that you and I have bought into a lot of misconceptions that makes prayer even more difficult for us to enter into? And I, so much so that I put a couple of them on your outline because I want you to think about this. I believe these are the things that interfere with us being able to pray where we get bored or we get confused or we get frustrated. And so our frustrations with prayer can a lot of times come out of misconceptions. So I want to talk to you about these. And these misconceptions, that, uh, let me tell you who's behind them. Satan's behind them. And what I know about Satan, right, I'm going to tell you his MO. What he does is he takes a little bit of truth and he makes it with a whole lot of lie and he gets us to buy into it. And so you and I need to be smarter than that. So as we look at these these misconceptions that maybe we're exposed to by the culture, by television, by maybe even poor teaching. We need to recognize them for what they are. We need to recognize them as distractions in our life and they get us sidelined when prayer, with prayer. So let's look at those four of them real quick. The first one is that prayer is not meant to be a magical wand. You know, a magical wand. And we can all think about like Harry Potter, right, with his wand where he goes, says some words, shoo, shoo. Bam, and all the things change right around him, all the circumstances. Well, a lot of times people will treat prayer like that. If I just name it and say the magical words, it is, boom, going to change my circumstances and happen. Right? A little bit of truth, a lot of lie. Doesn't happen. Prayer is also not a fire extinguisher. I see that a lot. And what I mean by that is a fire extinguisher, something that hangs on the wall, and when there's an emergency, we read the little sign that says, break the glass, boom, in case of emergency, right? And so what we see a lot of times is people would treat prayer like that. They don't pray in the good times, no. They wait till the emergency comes in, bam, they break the, you know, they break the glass and they pull out the, the fire hose of prayer, and they spray everything down, right? <laughs> yeah, like a hurricane's coming, a hurricane's coming, let's pray, I got a diagnosis of cancer. Oh, my God, I need to pray. My husband's about ready to walk out. My family's falling apart. Man, I need to pray, right? It's in the crisis that they want to go there, and you can almost hear it in the way they talk. I've done everything. I just, uh, prayer is the only thing that's left, <laughs> right? Like, oh, poor you, <laughs> right? You got to pray now. Listen, prayer is not meant to be the last resort. It's meant to be the first resort. It's meant to be the first thing you do. Before you buy the car, you pray. Before you accept the date, you pray, right? Before you accept a job, you pray. And so you put that first. And so prayer isn't a fire extinguisher, you know, in case of emergencies only. And then I also see a misconception where prayer is seen as a tug of war, right? That prayer is not meant to be this tug of war. Like, like God is up there and he's got everything. And so we got to rip it from his being, right? We got to get him to give it to us. So we got to say the right word and just kind of pull out from him the blessing, the help that we need. And so we would get engaged in things like, you know, talking to him. Go, please, 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 God, please, 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 right? Help me. Or we bargain with him. God, if you do that for me, <laughs> I'll do this for you right? And you like bargain. You bargain with him. But yet, prayer is not meant to be a tug of war where you are, you know, trying to pull down a blessing. And then there's my misconception I grew up in with the Catholicism that I was part of, where prayer, it was a ritual to relieve guilt for my bad choices, right? I'd go in and I'd talk and uh, confess my sins, and I was told to go and do I don't know, a couple of Hail Marys and some Our Fathers, right? And so all of a sudden, prayer became this penitent place, this place of punishment for bad choices and to relieve my guilt. Guys, all that I just talked about has some truth and merit, but there's a whole lot of lie around it. And what ends up happening is you and I, we go and we approach prayer and we get bored or we get confused on why things aren't happening. We get frustrated. And so we need to understand that these misconceptions are not what the Word of God says to do with prayer. Not at all. So I want to talk to you about what does the Word of God say about prayer? Where should it stem? How should it come out when we're praying? And there are four foundations or four pillars of prayer that should permeate our whole being, and we should speak out of that. So the first one on your outline, four foundational truths about prayer. First one is that God loves 
to talk to me, right? That God loves for me to talk with him. That God loves for me and for you to talk with him about what? <laughs> Quickly, anything. Anything at all, right? God just wants us to talk to him. And it doesn't have to be about something spiritual or religious. God is just interested in us. He just wants us to come and to talk with him. He says, talk to me about whatever you're interested in. And I know you're going, is that possible? How could God be interested in anything I want to talk about? Are you sure? Yeah, I am. Here's why. Because God loves you. He loves you. He's crazy about you. And because he loves you, it kind of works like this. I deeply love my husband, Andy, right? And so I'm interested in things that I'm not really interested in because I love him, right? <laughs> yeah, well, God kind of works like that. Also, um, God is interested in us, right? Because he inbred it in us to want to do these things. So like the hobbies you have, the sports you enjoy, you know, the things you enjoy doing, he's actually encoded inside of you the want to do those things. And so he's put it inside you, so why wouldn't he want to talk to you about it? He created that inside of you, right? And then my, for sure, I know he's interested in you, is because you are his child. He is your heavenly father, and you are his child, right? And I know if you're a parent like me, my kids mean everything to me. I'm interested in, no matter what they want to talk about, I am interested in it, right? And I don't really get bored. I don't really understand it <laughs> sometimes when they're talking to me, but I love to watch a little mouth move. I love to listen to them because I love to be in relationship, and I'm highly interested. God is like that. He is highly interested. He calls himself our father. Look at this in Psalm 103. 13, he says, the Lord is like a father to his children. You are his children. And he, he is tender and compassionate to those who reverence him. In other words, reverence being spending time. When you spend time with him, you make a, a, an, a, a time to be with him. What you're going to encounter is somebody who's tender hearted towards you, who's compassionate, not a, you did wrong, Right? but somebody who's compassionate and loving towards you. That is what you're going to find. And he wants you to come and he wants you to talk about anything that you want to talk to him about, right? He cares for you. You know, I have three children. They're grown now. But when they popped out of the womb, right? When they came out, I had to have C-section, so right? When they came out, I can tell you with 100% certainty, I love them. I love it. For the very first time they breathed, there was this connection, and I absolutely love them. Guys, that's how Father God feels about us. That's how he feels about you. He loves you. He cares for you. And, and when I gave birth to my children, you know, they couldn't talk to me. They couldn't communicate with me. Not at all. Not at all. But you know what? I figured out how to help them and how to meet their needs and to walk with them because I had this deep love and a desire to want to, to be in connection with them. That's how God feels towards us. And let me tell you, whether you won't talk to him, you can't talk to him, whichever, whatever it is, God loves you more now than he has ever loved you, and that's not going to change. But he does want this connection with you. He does want to be able to communicate with you. So how do we communicate with God exactly? Well, to me, prayer is a language, one that you learn a lot like your English language. When you start to look at kids when they're little, you know, children, they would watch people. They would be in proximity to us. Uh, and so they can learn to see how we talk, how we think. And then you can almost see it. If you think about your toddlers and your little ones, they watch your mouth and they watch how you react. And then they try to mimic you, don't they? They do, and then they get the words, and they start to get the sentences, and, and then they start to get concepts, and they start to talk, and they never stop, <laughs> right? Well, that's how we need to be with the Father God, you know? We didn't pop out of the womb being able to go four scored seven years ago. We, we didn't do that. We had to learn slowly. And so when we enter into a conversation with God, we just need to be able to know that it's not going to be this, you know, this high, intense conversation it's probably going to be more like the little guys, the kids, and that God loves us and that he wants to encourage us to talk to him. In John 5, verses 14 to 15, it says this. We can be confident approaching God knowing that he listens to us whenever we ask him for anything according to his will. And since we know that he hears us, 
when we make our requests, then we can be assured that he will answer us. Now, with this, I wanted you to see it. I put it here specifically because I want you to see that he listens to us. He hears us. Every time you sit to talk, Father God hears you. He's listening intently to what you're saying. And if you got a pencil, you might as well circle this last one. And he answers us. He answers us. And so God wants, to know that, wants you to know that that's what he wants to do for you. He's listening to you. And he wants to answer you. Now, so let me step back and say, okay, so then what is prayer? What are we calling prayer? And I put it on your outline because it's very important for you to get this. That prayer, prayer is, is just a conversation. That's all it is. It's a conversation. It's not a ceremony. I'm going to juxtapose it as ceremony. Ceremony is there's this right way to do it, wrong way to do it, rules, regulations. In a conversation, you just go, hey, man, how you doing? Right? And it's so natural, so easy. And prayer should be a conversation, not a ceremony. And also, prayer should be about building relationships, and it's not a ritual. You know, it's about building a relationship, not a ritual. A relationship, if you wanted to get to know me and I you, what would you do? You'd, you'd want to sit down. You would want to talk to me. You'd want to find out what are my likes, my dislikes. You know, why do I do this or do that? And, and so that's the same with Father God. He is inviting you and I into prayer which means come and have a conversation in the guise and in the hopes of learning who I am. Do you see that? And so that's what prayer is. It's this conversation that we need to be having with the Father. And so your first pillar when you go to pray is to know that God wants you to talk to him. He loves for you to talk to him, to have that conversation exchange. Why? So that you guys can build on building a relationship. Number two pillar I want to talk about is that God listens to prayers that are sincere and simple. Now, I love this. They're sincere and they're simple. They're not full of flowery language and fancy words, right? They're just very simple. Hey, God, how you doing? Right? And they're also sincere. And sincere talks about your heart, doesn't it? When I'm sincere, I tell you what's going on inside of me. I don't try to hide it. I just kind of just let it all out. I'm authentic, right? I'm genuine. I'm real. I just, here it is, God, right? And so we're honest before him, and we tell him how we feel, how we think about stuff, and we just do it in your everyday language. For me, for me, it's, hey, God, it's Sharon this morning. How you doing? You know, I had a pretty good rest. Yeah. You know what? I had a dream, maybe a dream that bothered me. Hey, can I talk to you about that for a moment? Hey, Lord, don't forget my children. I love them so much, right? And so I'll pour out my heart before them, you know? And, and, and so that's what God wants. He wants this honest radicalness where we come to him and we just go, boom, this is who I am. He doesn't want me to be you. He doesn't want you to be me. But he does want us to be sincere in our hearts and as we're sharing. And you might be thinking, hey, you know, I'm not in a good season right now. And so, well, I'm really kind of mad at God. I really don't like what he's doing. I don't like the way things are moving here. Maybe, maybe I, I shouldn't talk to him because I just want to complain. Well, listen, I want to tell you, if that's you, you go to the book of Psalms. And I want you to look. There's one-third of them. It's called the lamenting psalm. What that means is it's a complaining psalm. <laughs> it's God, I need a job. You can get me one. God, the evil people are winning here. God, where are you, right? I love the book of Psalms. I just love it because it just... It kind of talks about how we feel so often. And God wants us to have that radical honesty and sharing with him. And he can take it. He said, just come to me sincere and simple. Matter of fact, Jesus said this in Matthew 6, 5 and 8 when he's talking about prayer. He says, when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites. For they love to pray standing in the synagogue and on the street corners to be seen by men. In other words, they make a pageantry of this thing. He says, I tell you the truth, they've received the reward in full. Instead, when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep babbling on and on like the pagans, for they think they would be uh, heard because of their many words, right? Please, God, please, God, please, God. <laughs> right? That's what it's talking about. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you have need of before you ask him. 
right? So again, underscoring this whole, whole idea that God says, just come with simplicity and with the sincere heart and you will be received. Now, the next pillar when we talk about prayer is number three, God likes to show his grace by answering prayer. God wants to show you his grace, his character by answering your prayers. That's right. We have a good God. We have a gracious heavenly father who's full of compassion, who loves us, who delights in being able to answer our prayers. And we need to know that about him and come into that presence and that knowledge that that is indeed truth, that God is a gracious God and he wants to, to move on us. And a lot of times you and I, we don't ask for things, right? But yet 20 times in the Bible it says to ask and it will be given to you. It says to seek to seek and you will find, right? And it says to knock on the door and the door will be answered. So what we're hearing is take the initiative when you're sitting with Father God and go ahead and start to asking him. When things, I don't understand things that happen sometimes, like the stuff down in Florida and my heart is broken, and I will ask him, I put it right to him, Lord, how could this be? How could something so evil have happened? And so I will engage Father God on that dialogue, right? Because I believe he wants to be able to answer us. And a lot of times we don't ask those questions because we feel, oh, it's off limits, right? Can't ask that. No, he wants you to come. He wants you to, to, to seek him. And he promises if you seek after him, you will find him. You seek after the answer, you'll find the answer. Why? Because he loves you and he's a good God and his character is all about answering us. He always answers us. Now, doesn't always answer us the way we want to be answered, right? Sometimes he says no to our request. And I, I tell you, I've, I've never met a parent that gave their child everything they asked for. They had, I had a lot of reasons why I didn't. Father God has a lot of reasons why he will say no to us. There's a lot of reasons why he'll say no to us, and he's God and we're not. And we need to grow in that understanding. So sometimes he'll say no to us to protect us. And sometimes he says no to us because he wants us to go in a different direction. And sometimes he says no to us because the course that we're walking on is not the one he wants and he wants to redirect, he wants to correct what's going on. And then there's always a time he says no because he's more interested in my character than my comfort, <laughs> right? So God will answer no sometimes, but here's what I want you to hear. He always answers. He always answers. I hear people often say, God didn't answer, he didn't answer me. Been asking, but no, no, nothing, nothing. Listen, God answers us always. And he answers us in one of four ways. He says, yes, no, right? Or not yet, which is a timing. Or he says, you gotta be kidding. <laughs> like I asked him, I said, hey, Lord, I want the Washington Redskins to win their division. He goes, ha ha, right, right? Not gonna happen. You're kidding well, I wasn't, but he, he said no, right? Okay, guys, so here's my, I'm having fun with you, but actually God does answer us, yes, no, or not yet. And so we need to know that. We need to go to God in prayer and know that he will always answer you because he promises us in his word that he does. So when we're there and we're asking him, the yes, the no, we get. The not yet is the hardest. And you know it was the hardest for my kids to get not yet because they would ask me something and I'd go, uh, not yet. And they would take it as no, right? And so as we mature, we need to know that the not yet's in life have nothing to do with a no. It's just not ready. It's not done yet. And so we need to be able to walk in the understanding, especially as we mature in our faith. Now, Jeremiah 33, 3 says in the message, it says, call to me and I will answer you. Circle that. I will answer you. I will show you marvelous and wondrous things that you ha could not figure out on your own. And the reason I put that down there for you to look at is because God's perspective, and you need to remember this, is always bigger than your perspective. Always. And so we think, if I just get this thing, I'll be happy. And God knows our entire life. And he goes, no, not really. Not really, because he created us. He knows. He can see the 360. You and I can only see like going right in front of our face. And so we need to know that God is wanting to grow our perspective to be bigger also. And so the not yet teach us a bigger perspective and we need to be able to sit down and rest in that. And we need to, and I, because I know when I get a not yet, 
You know, you just want to, you want to do the two-year-old dance. What do you mean, right? You get frustrated. It's not just me, right? Get frustrated. And yet, in Matthew 7, verse 11, it says this. If you being, uh, a per if you being imperfect and sinful parent know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give good gifts to those who ask him? And so what he says is, hey, Sharon, you're so messed up, <laughs> right? You got all these ulterior motives. You got all this going on. And yet you can give good kids, you know, give, give good gifts to your children. What? I'm better than you, which he is. And I know how to give even better gifts. Do you trust me on that? And so when I get the no or the not yet, I have to lean into his character that says, man, he loves me. He has a bigger perspective than me. I'm going to go with him on this thing right? I'm going to go with him on it. And so I lean into his character and that's what we need to do. We need to be able to do that. So God loves to show his grace to his children. He loves to show his hand. He loves to answer prayers and that's what he does. The next one, the last foundational pillar, and this one will rock your world if you really understood it. Number four, God longs to be close to me. He longs to be close to me. In other words, he can't wait to be with me. He can't wait to talk to me. He loves you. He wants to be with you. He wants to be close to you, right? He's waiting, always waiting for you. I think about, I think about my, uh, my dog, right, that I had. And uh, whenever, whenever uh, I came home, right, I'd turn into the driveway and you can hear him start to bark. He's so excited. And, and if I were in and Andy was coming home and he turned, you know, into the driveway, the dog started to prance around. He's like, yeah, he's home, he's home. And he's so excited and his tail's going and, you know, and he's like, and he's like talking, rawr, 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 rawr. you know, I mean, just over the top excited. And it doesn't matter what time of night it is, 24 hours a day. <laughs> he's just excited. Well, that's how God is. He's never too busy for you. 24 hours a day, he's open. Every moment of every day of every second Every time that you need to s say something, he's there for you. He'll never ignore you. In Isaiah 30, 18, it says, the Lord waits for you to come to him. Look at that. He waits for you to come to him so he can show you his love and compassion. He wants you to come to him. He's waiting for you to talk to him. He wants you to do that. Yet, isn't it oh so easy to get up in the morning and then you hit, your feet hit the ground and you're just running, right? And so, you know, we, we won't pray, we won't talk to him, we won't have that conversation, that relational connection, because we're too busy, and then our day is hectic. And so you can go through a whole day and not talk to the Lord, right? You can go, and that day bleeds into the next, and that bleeds into a week, and then that bleeds, you know, into the month, and the months go by, and pretty soon it's a year. And I want you to get this in your head, that Father God is sitting there waiting, He's waiting to talk to you. He's waiting for you to not be busy. He's waiting because he loves you. Now, there are some of you guys that have special needs kids, right? And your kids um, are unable to communicate with you, maybe physically or emotionally, but they can't talk to you, right? And doesn't your heart ache as a parent? You just long to have a conversation with them, and it just hurts you because you can't. Or some of you, you have children and they can communicate. And if something went wrong in the relationship you have with them, and all of a sudden, they don't want to talk to you. They're not interested, right? They don't want to share their life with you and how you just yearn for a phone call to hear their voice, for them to talk to you about anything, right? And your hearts are broken. This is how the Father feels about you. When you rush off in the day and, and, and you don't spend that time with him, his heart is broken. He's longing. He wants to talk to you. He wants you to stop and to communicate with him every day of every moment. And it doesn't have to be a big fancy prayer. It's just like, you know, sometimes I'll be driving and, and somebody will cut me off. And I don't, I'm not very nice. So, you know, they'll cut me off and I'll be like, ah, dang, blah, blah, and then I'll be, God, did you see that? And he goes, I did, Sharon, I did. <laughs> Remember, character over comfort. <laughs> right, that's how the Lord talks to me. So 
but every day we need to invite him in and every conversation you invite him. He is impassioned for you. He loves you. You can see it in Hosea 6.6. 6. It says this, I don't want your sacrifices. In other words, I don't want you to come to church to feed the poor, to give money. He's saying, I don't want your sacrifices. This is what he wants. I want your love. I want your love. I don't want your offering. I want you to know me. And so you can hear the passion inside of that verse. The passion that Father God has for us. That he loves you so much and he, he waits for you to come and talk to him. And I'm going to tell you, I've been living a long time. There is no man that can love you like that. There's no woman that can love you like that. There's no kids that can love you like that. This is the greatest love story that you have ever, ever been in, in and has experienced. And that is that Father God loves you with all that he is. And all the messed up that we are doesn't matter to him. He receives us. He wants to be our friend. He wants to be a companion with us. He wants us to be in relationship with him. Now that baby's crying, I'll tell you why. I'm going to tell you straight up why. Because the Holy Spirit is here. And children have a way of whining they have, because they can feel the atmosphere changing. I wish I was as smart as that kid. Okay? Here's the thing. When the Holy Spirit's moving, we need to, we need to go, okay, God, what's going on here? What is it that you want? And God is saying, draw close to me. In Psalm 25, 14, it says, Friends with, friendship with God is reserved for those who reverence him. That means make time for him, right? That's where it happens. With them, he shares the secrets of his covenant. In other words, in the 21 days of prayer that we are doing in fasting, God is saying to you, that if you will make that a priority, if you will, will enter into this, that he will do more than you could ever dream, hope, or imagine, that he will actually, with his covenant, begin to show you the plans and the purpose he has for your life. But he's calling you to get him close. And just in case you missed it, the Holy Spirit has been here, and he says to you today, if you draw close to God, God will draw close to you. That is what the Spirit of the Lord is saying. That is what he's looking for. And in this uh, time that we have set aside, we call it the new normal. Wouldn't it be fantastic to make it your new normal where you have this relationship with God, this community and conversation with him where you just sit and you just like talk, just like you're sitting here listening. You just kind of talk and then you pause and you go, do you have anything to say, Lord? And then you begin to separate your voice out from his and then you begin to experience the simplicity of talking to your very best friend, the one who's the lover of your soul. What if we begin to understand that we were designed to partner up with him and to be the light of the world? And so the tragedies that take place in our lives, that you are the answer that God wants to show the world. He wants this to display in you and in me the love that Jesus Christ has for people. And so what if? This next 21 days, what if we could develop that kind of relationship? What if we could get very acquainted with the one that loves us? And all of a sudden, this new normal becomes normal, becomes part of us. Bow your heads with me and I'll close in prayer. Father, I thank you. I thank you that you're moving, Lord. Just like I thank you, that sweet little child, that it's a reminder that you're busy at work in this auditorium. And I thank you for that, Lord. Now, Father, fill my mind and my heart with your words so that I might pray for your people as you so choose, Father. Okay, I hear not all my people. So those of you that are far from God, I want to speak to you first. While every head is bowed and people are praying because they're in touch with where the Holy Spirit is in their lives, those of you that don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, I want to talk to you. You know, I've been talking about this love relationship and you're like, I don't get it. <laughs> I want it, but I don't get it. Well, the Father says if you will draw close to him, he will draw close to you. And so I want to lead you in a prayer right now if that's you. If you, uh, God says, for some of you that feel far from him, 
that he never moved, you did. So some of you need to recommit also. Right where you're at, you just say, Father God, I want what that woman is talking about. I don't understand it all, but I want to experience that love. And so forgive me for my sins, places where I've chosen poorly. I accept your son, Jesus Christ, as my savior and the leader of my life. Now I'm going to pray for those that are praying that prayer. Father, I thank you that you sealed that in their heart and that you wrote their name in the book of life and that you have actually drawn close to them. And so now, Father God, I lift them up to you. Take care of them, Father. Take care of them. I hear that. Grow them up into your mighty children. And Father, so clearly has your Holy Spirit spoken to us. Yet I know the flesh is weak, Father. And so, Lord, I take this opportunity and I lift up your people that are called by your name, Lord God. I lift them up to you now and I ask, Holy Spirit, that you would give them the power to walk out what they know to be true, Lord. That they would actually be able to sit and have a conversation and build a relationship with you. Father, create in them the ability to go there, the desire. And Father, when they are confronted with confusion or boredom, Father, would you bring to their memory what it is that they learned about prayer that would cause them not to see the preciousness of what's happening in that moment. Father, I thank you. I thank you that you um, are here. Uh Uh-huh. Yes. And that you love us so radically, so intensely, that you say that, that until you love me with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and with every breath of life here on this earth, that you will continue to come and, and uh, call us up to higher levels. Call us up to, to come closer and closer and closer until we go to be with you. Now, Father, I thank you for the message. I thank you for what you're doing in the lives of those that could hear what your spirit said. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for tuning in to today's message. If God is impacting your life through this ministry, join us in reaching others by investing today. You can give by texting your donation amount to 757-230-2110 or by going to vineyardchurch.com slash give. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an update. We'll see you next week.